So, so uh, the, uh, the topic I'm going to uh, choose for these two lectures is uh, quantum critical metal. These are some of these uh, uh, non permutative in, in states that uh, Sentil was, was uh, mentioning in his talk. Uh, so, this is really, uh, to a large degree, an open question. This is a, this is a state of matter or states of matter that, that don't have a really good theory. Uh, so, I'm, I'm really concerned. I'm going to talk about things that I don't really understand. Um, uh, but, uh, right, but that's part of the fun, right? That's part of the privilege uh, of uh, uh, that we were uh, allowed to work on things we don't understand. Um, so uh, uh, these are some of my uh, collaborators on this, uh, on this endeavor. Uh, uh, these are the uh, students and uh, postdocs. Sam, Sam uh, started as uh, a student at Stanford and now is a postdoc at MIT. Uh, Elaine Schachter is my student at Weizmann, and uh, Max is a student in, uh, in Cologne, and uh, these are some of the more senior uh, members of this collaboration. Okay, so, so uh, uh, I, I uh, want to talk about quantum, quantum criticality in metals, uh, so basically quantum critical points in metals. Uh, so this is kind of the background. Uh, if you think about quantum critical points, so these are temperature zero uh, quantum phase conditions, a continuous uh, transition at zero temperature. If they happen in insulators, uh, 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 they're they're fairly fairly well well understood. So that means if you have a, a gap state on one side of the uh, transition, a different gap state on the other side, and the system becomes gapless only at one point. Okay, so you could uh, there are uh, conditions in, in, in insulators they're relatively well understood. You can read it, read it often, uh, for instance, in Sabir's book. Uh, and the uh, question I'm going to raise in these, in these lectures is what happens when a system with a Fermi surface goes critical? Okay, so so uh, things, uh, as, as, as we'll see, things are quite different. So, but uh, before I'm, uh, I'll, I'll get into that, uh, you know, I'll go slowly and I'll discuss a little bit uh, a, a critical phenomena first in classical systems and then in, uh, in quantum systems. Uh, okay, so, so this is... Uh, just to, just to set the background, okay, so the uh, study of uh, critical phenomena is really a study of scaling variance. Okay, so so uh, it, you have a system that, that, that uh, doesn't have any particular symmetry, but at the critical point, there's actually a very large emergent symmetry group, uh, in, uh, and part of that symmetry group is uh, scale symmetry. So this is uh, at long wavelength, the system uh, 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 develops a, a symmetry under, under scaling. Uh, Transformation, and uh, this is actually a nice uh, illustration of that. So, so, so this is uh, a, what's going on here is that uh, a, these are snapshots of uh, simulations of the Isaac model, taken from different scales. Okay, so, so uh, it's the same simulation of the Isaac model at criticality, and you see that the uh, different plots sort of look the same, but you can see how they actually fit to, uh, into each other. Okay, so. They really look the same if you if if if, if, uh, if, uh, if, if this if this um, if video didn't tell you, you really couldn't tell which which one is different from the scale. That was a classical kind of thing. This is a, this is the uh, classical two D Isaac model. Right? Okay, so this is scale invariance. This is kind of a visually striking example. A, 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 this is uh, formally this is the, the way to. Uh, Write it, okay, so uh, a, every correlation function of the order power, for instance, the two-point function, would, uh, would have a definite a, a, a transformation law under, under scale, 
Uh, okay, so if you are we scale distance in this way, uh, the two-point function would scale in a particular way, okay, with some pretty correspondent, which is associated with the field pi. Every field and every endpoint function would have a similar transformation law. Basically, all the correlation functions scale this way. Okay, now it turns out that this uh, scale transformation is actually only one asymmetry uh, operation out of, out of a much bigger symmetry group very often. For instance, that is the case in Gandhi mode. And so uh, uh, the system is actually symmetric under any conformal transformation, okay, of which the uh, 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 scaling is, is only a uh, scale transformation is only one one element. Okay, so uh, there's very good theoretical control of, of uh, critical phenomena. Okay, so using the uh, normalization group, uh, which are supported by uh, a classical Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so these are. Uh, and critical phenomena are really under very good theoretical control. Okay, and they're, they're an example. The reason they're exciting is uh, because of universality. Okay, so uh, the idea here is that because of the fact that the uh, correlation length at the critical point diverges, the system kind of forgets all the microscopic details, and a, a, a only a very few details actually matter, like the symmetry of the order power, a, 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 a parameter of it, and the uh, spatial dimension. Okay, so, so this is a striking example of a case where uh, we can really make theoretical predictions even if we don't know anything microscopic about the system. And that's, that's, that's a great help because often we don't know much microscopic information on the Okay, so, so this is, uh, in some sense, this is a theorist dream. And uh, the same ideas of uh, a critical phenomena, which are central in the matter physics, are also important in uh, quantum field theory. So they're often, in some sense, you are tuning close to a quantum critical point. So the mass gap is much smaller than the moving scale. Okay, so uh, now, if you think about quantum systems, there's a very useful analogy. Okay, so, so uh, a, the difference between quantum and classical is that a, in, a, in a quantum system, you cannot separate the dynamics from thermodynamics. Okay, so if you, if you were given the Hamiltonian, that dictates both the thermodynamics of the system, but also the dynamics of the system. So if you can think about a quantum critical point a, as uh, living in one, one uh, a, a basically one dimension higher, which is prime. Okay, so uh, if this would be some, some, uh, some order powder, and it can fluctuate both in, in the spatial direction and in the temporal dimension. And this is uh, this is imaginary time. It has a finite extended finite temperature, which is basically one over t, one over the temperature. In the limit of zero temperature, this uh, extra dimension actually uh, uh, diverges, and uh, the system really behaves like a system in one in, 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 in one dimension higher. Okay, so uh, 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 often it is the case that you can actually map a a, a the, the, the properties of a critical point, a classical a critical point in d plus one dimensions to a quantum critical point in d, in d dimensions, and you can read off all the uh, uh, the exponents and so forth. Okay, this is not always the case because uh, in a, in a, a quantum system, uh, the scaling that you'll find at the critical point may not be the same in the time direction and in the spatial uh, spatial dimension. Okay, uh, sometimes you also get very phase effects. Uh, they're not there in the, in the uh, classical problem, but uh, uh, very often it is the case that a uh, uh, time scales the same as space. Okay, so we can call that in, in uh, emergent Lorentz invariance. Okay, the system again didn't have microscopically, and then you, you can simply make this mapping okay, from, from uh, a quantum d-dimensional to, to classical d plus one dimensional. Okay, so. Uh, uh, so uh, that's these are quantum critical points. Uh, the kind of classic example of that is the transverse field Ising model, uh, okay, which has a function of the transverse field uh, 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 at zero temperature can undergo a transition between the uh, uh, quantum par uh, paramagnetic and the, uh, uh, and the uh, magnetic phase. Now you can ask why? Why do we care about uh, uh, these kind of uh, 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 phenomena that occur strictly at zero temperature, which uh, of course, we can never actually access in any experiment. Okay, and uh, a, a, so, so this would be the zero temperature phase diagram of the transverse field rising model. So this is, of course, a completely uh, a, a theoretical construct. Okay, so this, this occurs really at zero temperature. 
And the reason we care is that, that the, uh, the physical behavior at finite temperature would actually reflect the properties of this underlying quantum critical point. Okay? So for, for instance, in this fan-shaped region above the quantum critical point, you'll find scaling behavior, which actually is characteristic of the, uh, the, uh, of the exponents of the underlying quantum critical point. The idea here is that, that the only a, a, a scale would be the uh, temperature, th th therefore, a physical properties like the spin susceptibility would actually differ due to the next component, which is a, a property of the quantum physical point. Okay, and this is something physical. This is something you can measure in the app. Okay, so uh, so these are this this is an example of a, uh, a quantum physical point in an insulator because both both sides are a, a are are gap. Okay, and the only a, a, a gaplessness occurs right at the physical point. Now I, I, I want to switch gears and actually talk about uh, a, a metals, about um, a, a system with a systems with a uh, firm surface. So this is kind of a very simple view of a, a firm liquid, which is which is the, the theory for a, uh, a for a metal. Okay, so so uh, a firm liquid is actually very simple. Okay, so here's the still firm seat. <laughs> okay, now a sorry. Right, so so uh, if you think about the excitations of uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, so so uh, they're almost like a point-like objects, like electrons. Okay, so here's an example. Okay, but when you put in such a such a point-like ob object, it gets stressed. It leaves a trail <laughs> uh, in the in the Fermi scene, So that's a a, a quasi particle. So that's the uh, a elementary excitation of the a, a, of the Fermi liquid. Okay, so so uh, a uh, right, so so uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, this this would be uh, a description in the in the Brillouin zone of the uh, of the Fermi liquid, the sharp surface called the Fermi surface, which uh, separates the filled state from the empty states. Uh, uh, okay, and the uh, uh, excitations of the state would be either quasi particles or, or uh, uh, quasi holes. As you know, probably even if you add interactions, this looks this picture looks completely like non-interacting electrons. But uh, a, the strength of this of this uh, a, of Fermi liquid theory is that this picture a, remains qualitatively, a, qualitatively correct even in the presence of interactions. For instance, the Fermi surface remains sharp. If you look at the uh, a, a occupation number n of k of the electrons, it still has a jump on a, a finite jump on this uh, a, on this uh, a, a surface. Okay, so so uh, the question I'm going to be dealing with in these lectures is basically what happens if the system with the, with the Fermi surface becomes a uh, quantum critical. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to add a, another fluctuating degree of freedom, which are the uh, a fluctuations of some order parameter, which is about, about to uh, develop, and they're they're going to couple to uh, a quasi particle to quasi holes close to the Fermi surface. So so uh, the Fermi surface itself is a very quantum mechanical object. Point that before we could uh, we could basically understand the properties of one critical point using an analogy to a, to a classical system in one dimension higher. Here, this is not going to work because the Fermi surface itself is a very quantum mechanical object. It has no classical analog, so uh, a, a, a quantum critical phenomena in metals are going to be really a uh, quantum phenomena. Okay, so so uh, what happens if if this system becomes critical? So you can you can uh, picture it as the Fermi surface undergoing strong quantum fluctuations. Okay, so so uh, you might imagine that what actually happens is that uh, the Fermi surface sort of becomes smeared uh, and uh, it might even get destroyed. So this really means that a quasi particle near the, the Fermi surface gets scattered so so strongly that uh, it's not the well defined excitation anymore. So this will be a non Fermi liquid metal. Okay. So so. Uh, uh, these are the kind of states that we want to do, that we want to describe. Uh, okay, so so uh, uh, let me talk a little bit about about uh, uh, about materials. Uh, uh, right. So so uh, uh, just to just to give you a sense that these these kind of questions are not completely academic. Okay, so there are, there are some. Some uh, real materials that seem to seem to do this. So uh, this is an example. This is uh, one of the so-called iron-based superconductors. This is the phosphor-doped one point two. 
iron-based material. Okay, so and this is the phase diagram as a function of uh, a composition x and temperature t. So a, the system has all sorts of order in it that I'll actually describe in more detail later. It has a um, magnetic order and it has pneumatic order, which I'll discuss. But what, what that is, and as a function of x, you see that both of these types of order are actually suppressed. If you extrapolate, they seem to vanish at, at, the, at a quantum critical point, or maybe two quantum critical points, somewhere uh, around here, x equals 0.3, and uh, there is also superconductivity, which kind of uh, lives around this quantum critical point in this dome-shaped region. <laughs> the colors here represent the exponent with which the uh, resistivity vanishes at lower lower temperature. Okay, so they fit the resistivity to this form, some constant plus uh, a times t to the power alpha, and uh, this exponent alpha is plotted here in this color color map. Okay, so uh, a, a, the blue region here corresponds here and there, corresponds to alpha which just goes two. And that's that number is familiar. Okay, that that's that's the uh, a resistivity of a, a of a Fermi liquid metal. So that's a, 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 actually what you expect in a, a conventional metal, but you see this kind of, uh, you can a, a, imagine this fan-shaped fan -shaped region, which is uh, even you can imagine it with this kind of converging to the quantum critical point, which has an exponent which is closer to one. Okay, so uh, T squared is a Fermi liquid, T is something else, T is, might be a non-Fermi liquid metal, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's actually no good theory for a metal that has a resistivity that goes linearly with the uh, temperature. It, it's not all the way to low temperature. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that we want to explain. Yes? But if there's no theory for that state, how do you know that it's associated with one? Why? So I, I don't. Okay, so, so uh, it's just that quantum criticality is kind of a relatively generic way to destroy the permanent state. So, so it's an hypothesis. So, so it's a it's a, um, a hypothesis. It's one possible way that I know to get out of here. Okay, and, and this picture is is very very uh, suggestive. It doesn't mean that it is quantum criticality, but it does seem to uh, kind of converge towards this point. I mean, conventional metals are sort of nice in the sense that they have such a nice separation of energy scales. They need to this is a low temperature for a while. Final stretch, and that's where we're seeing from the liquid theory. And these materials, in what sense, these materials are as nice the energy. Well, yeah. Like so right. I feel like you're, you're, I mean, I always, whenever I see this sort of uh, train of thought, motivational train of thought. Yeah. I feel like this is kind of like directing the small man in how to yeah. say that right. I want to kill from the liquid theory, and I feel like well, you just you told me that you. Because it's not, it's an asymptotical temperature statement. Yeah. It has ultraviolet cutoff that has been sent to infinity. Yeah. Like right. Radical right. 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 So, 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 um, it, 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 yeah. So, so that's, 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 a, that's, of course, a good question. So, metals have definitely a regime that high temperature was the same So, so, uh, and, and all of these statements are, are actually asymptotic. Now, in, in this example, you, Right, but here you, you don't go below PC, but that's that's already uh, on on the scale of the nail temperature. That's already relatively low. Okay, so you have to fear a factor of uh, you know three, and uh, you do see at the same temperature scale both types of behavior. So that's maybe one one kind of uh, argument you can make. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, later on some evidence that uh, a, some sort of critical fluctuation might be might be living uh, over a big temperature window here. So yeah, but it's of course it's that three decades. No, 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 no definitely, definitely, definitely. There, there are never three decades in this. So what did you do in scale? I, I, I agree. I agree. Right. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so, um, uh, yeah. These, these uh, reservations are going to become, of course, more serious. Also, when I show Merce, where I will never show you three, three decades at once. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in my, so, uh, it, yeah, but um. It, it, this is what we want to explain. Now, now just, just to emphasize, to follow up on uh, the main comment, okay, there's a big debate in, in the corporate materials, which you may have heard a, a lot about this linear in, in T resistivity. There, it's, it's, it seems to persist up to very high temperature. 
very high room temperatures of, so from about Pc or even below when you suppress Pc by a field up to a temperature of 1000 Kelvin. Okay, and uh, there it's kind of uh, it, 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 this idea of quantum chemicality as a source of the linear key has been criticized because it's kind of hard to believe that uh, any sort of quantum uh, critical fluctuations can survive up to such high temperature. Okay, so that's, that's another liberation. So it's, it's, it's definitely not agreed on that this linear key. It seems very generic in correlated materials as a property of uh, quantum criticality, but uh, nevertheless, that's, that's uh, an idea that's been around in this picture is, is very suggestive. Okay, now, now uh, this kind of a phase diagram of, uh, a, of a magnetic phase or spin density wave, which is uh, suppressed as a function of some parameter and then gives rise to unconventional superconductivity, that seems to be very generic. Okay, so that repeats over and over again in many different materials, which uh, kind of suggests that it's a very generic mechanism to get unconventional superconductivity. Okay, so this is, uh, this is another iron based superconductor this time built with cobalt. And again, as a function of cobalt carbon concentration, you see that uh, the spin is to a phase goes away, and you get this uh, superconducting phase. In, this is an organic superconductor. Okay, this now is a function of pressure. The tuning parameter is different, but they're the same phase diagram. Okay, this is an electron dot cuprate, and this is a, a heavy fermion material. Okay, so it really looks like the, the one simple sort of universal mechanism for superconductivity in all these different materials, and uh, this mechanism is related in, in not necessarily to a quantum, to the to a spin this to a quantum critical point, but at least to, let's say, to the quantum phase transition between a metal and a magnetic metal. Okay, so to get superconductivity, you want to be just on the verge of magnetism. You know, in the, so the pictures are taken from these uh, from these review papers. Okay, and this is an outline of what I wanted to say. Uh, so uh, in, in, I've, in, in, I, I want to uh, describe uh, 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 antiferromagnetic and isomagnetic orders uh, in, uh, in in uh, 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 in iron-based superconductors as an example to introduce these uh, these kind of orders. Uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit the theory of uh, Metallic quantum critical points, that, as I said, is, is far from being, uh, being complete. That will describe what we have. And I'll talk about uh, superconducting instabilities near a pneumatic quantum critical point. Okay, so uh, um, uh, there's always the, uh, the uh, possibility that right at the critical point, the system actually becomes unstable to develop some other type of order. Okay, a, a system with a Fermi surface is physically very unstable because it has lots and lots of low, uh, low energy excitations. And uh, one generic possibility that the experiments seem to suggest is that, that you never actually reach a quantum critical point in the metal. It always gets masked by another type of order, like superconductivity. So I'll we'll discuss that in the case of the pneumatic quantum critical point. And uh, next time on, on, uh, will we'll be uh, the to go into a numerical approach, a quantum Monte Carlo, to these type of uh, problems and the progress that we've uh, made on that. Okay, so uh, coming back to the iron based superconductors, I'm going to go a little bit in more detail into the uh, ordering here to uh, uh, illustrate uh, sort of uh, what's, what's uh, Ising pneumatic order, which seems to occur here. So uh, uh, this is the phase diagram of the, of the cobalt material. And this is actually the uh, a magnetic order that occurs in this uh, magnetic phase. And uh, it, this is this, this square lattice of uh, iron uh, ions. And uh, this is actually the magnetic pattern that uh, uh, occurs here. Okay, so every row is actually ferromagnetic, and uh, 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 adjacent rows are anti aligned to each other. Okay, and you see that this kind of order can occur in two flavors. Okay, the system has to choose spontaneously whether uh, a horizontal or vertical uh, rows are going to be parallel to each other. Okay, so uh, you can say in addition to breaking diverse, uh, uh, diverse symmetry, the system also has to break, break the uh, C4 symmetry down to C2. 
Okay, these are, these are two different symmetry breakings, and they, they don't have to occur at the same point, at the same temperature or the same x. So uh, what happens actually if you go along this cut? Okay, so you fix x, say, in raised temperature, is that uh, at low temperature you have this uh, a magnetic phase, and it has to choose one of these two configurations. In fact, in the experiment, you can see domains between them. Okay, and then in raised temperature, these two types of water rings don't have to melt at the same point. Okay, so there's kind of a two-step melting process. You can first um, melt the uh, in, in the uh, magnetic order. Okay, it's not visible here, but there are actually uh, some faint lines pointing in this direction. So you go into what I call an isogenetic phase. Uh, what this means, uh, what happens in this phase is that uh, time versus symmetry is restored, uh, spin rotational symmetry is restored, but C4 symmetry of the lattice is broken down to C2. Okay, so for instance, if you look at the spin spin correlations between nearest and, uh, neighbor bonds in the x direction and y direction, they're actually different. So this will be the order parameter of this phase. And uh, the only at the higher temperature you go to the isotropic phase, where you restore the complete symmetry of the square lattice. Okay, so there, there are actually two transitions here that's been measured experimentally. Okay, this kind of separation between the two. And uh, this phase diagram kind of tries to extrapolate to zero temperature, and they assume that uh, they remain separated. Okay, so there are actually two quantum critical points here. Okay, this doesn't have to be the case, they may merge and become first order, but this is definitely a possibility. Okay, so uh, just to show you a evidence that there probably is pneumatic quantum criticality going on in this material, these are measurements done in uh, a, the efficient group. So they measured a, the uh, elastoresistive coefficient. That basically means that you, you, um, you stretch the crystal a little bit, okay, so you break by, a, by the strain. You uh, uh, break the symmetry between x and y, and then you make the a lattice, a, a lattice constant, a little bit different from the, from the y lattice constant, and you measure you measure the induced uh, resistivity and isotropy of the systems. Okay, so this is uh, a m66. That's the uh, a, 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 a six 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 just corresponds to a certain lattice direction, and uh, a, 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 a what this uh, coefficient tells you is basically the uh, induced resistivity and isotropy. A per unit strain. That's long. Okay, so uh, uh, this is proportional to some sort of a, a pneumatic susceptibility of the electrons. So how, how susceptible the electrons are to the <laughs> rotational symmetry of the of the crystal. Okay, and this is what it does as a function of temperature. Okay, so it seems to diverge on this line. Okay, on this line, and you see that it's sort of knows that there's a, that it approaches a critical point up to quite high temperature. Okay, up to 300 Kelvin, it only starts to diverge. And moreover, it actually diverges in a very simple uh, way. It uh, a, diverges in a curious way. So the uh, a, a elastoresistive coefficient looks like constant plus A over T minus T star, where uh, a T star is a temperature scale that's, a, that's X dependent, and it seems to vanish at the quantum critical point. Okay, the putative quantum critical point. Now, of course, we can't measure this all the way down to the critical point because there's superconductivity that's intervening in the way, and there they can't measure delta rho. Okay, so, the, so this measurement has to stop at, at the supermagnetic DC, but that's relatively low, that's about 30 Kelvin. So uh, in, in, it seems like pneumatic quantum criticality in this material is a, is a real phenomenon, and we have to take it seriously. Okay, so uh, in, in the rest of this uh, talk is going to be devoted to the theory of uh, metallic quantum criticality. So uh, let's see. So we still have half an hour. Uh, yeah. Okay. Why? So there are two types of quantum critical points that I'll be discussing. Okay, one of them is the isogenematic quantum critical point, which uh, I to, and the nictites, the, the iron ray superconductors. So this is a quantum critical point where a system with a, with a, a C4 symmetry, a symmetry of the square, it actually uh, it, 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 it breaks down to C2, okay, so a square breaks down to a rectangle. And if you have a Fermi surface, the Fermi surface would respond to the symmetry breaking. So, uh, for instance, in the symmetric phase, uh, the Fermi surface might look like this red curve. Okay, and uh, in the ordered phase, it would pick one of the two configurations, so it would look either like 
uh, this one or that one, okay, so it would basically become elliptical, and it would point either along x or along y, and you see that basically the entire Fermi surface has to distort as a result of this ordering, except for a discrete set of points, uh, uh, here are the points uh, along uh, 45 degrees, which don't actually move by, by symmetry, these are called cold spots. So basically the entire Fermi surface is going to be very strongly coupled to the fluctuations of the either pneumatic order parameter, except for at these cold spots. The other type of uh, a quantum critical point that I'll discuss is an antiferromagnetic quantum critical point, okay, where uh, it, you have uh, magnetic ordering in some wavelength, for example, pi pi. Okay, and here the uh, kinematics of this critical point is very different, because here actually uh, the points that are going to be strongly coupled to the order parameter are points where you can scatter resolutely uh, off fluctuations of this order parameter and remain on the Fermi surface. Okay, so there are so-called hot spots on the Fermi surface, which are connected uh, to other points on the Fermi surface by this uh, wave vector k. Okay, so there's a here in, in, in 2D, by the way, most of what I'm going to talk about is in 2D metals. Um, uh, so um, uh, the, the, the action is all going to happen close to this discrete set of hot spots. Hot spots. Okay, unlike here, where the action is everywhere except for at, at the cold spot. Okay, so uh, um, how do we construct a theory for um, a quantum critical points in metals? Okay, so the important uh, uh, thing to realize is that here there are two types of, uh, 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 of degrees of freedom at low energies, and you have to treat both of them kind of equally, which are the fermions and the order parameter fluctuations. Okay, so uh, 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 for the spin disk wave transition, this is the kind of uh, 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 quantum field theory that would write. Okay, so there's a simple action, which is the action of the fermions, the action of the order parameter field and the uh, interaction between them. Now, this is a field theory, so in principle, we're just supposed to write all the possible terms that are allowed by symmetry. So here are a few. Okay, for the fermions, this is uh, just three fermions, and we might add here quartic interactions and so forth, but short-range interactions. Okay, for the uh, field phi, there, there are gradient squared terms. The, the, uh, uh, this R is a tuning parameter that uh, uh, allows us to tune to the quantum critical point. There could, there could be a soft interaction, pi to the fourth, and so forth. Okay, and the interaction term is a, 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 is a term that's going to involve both phi and the, and the electron. The simplest term is a linear term in phi and a, a quadratic term in the in fermions. This is basically a term that couples the spin of, a, of the electrons to the, uh, a, a, to the nail order parameter. Okay, and it, 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 this, this uh, order parameter carries momentum q, which is in, in this example phi phi. A, this lambda is the so called Yukawa coupling. And uh, once again, there could be higher order terms if I do that. Yes? So, is there a reason why one has to jump to this degree of sophistication in the theory? Because in a more conventional theory, we would involve the Landau parameters of the Fermi wave where the interaction between the spins increase. Right. That would alter the thermodynamic phase diagram, right. okay, which is understood very well. Yes. Until the critical point is reached, then the antiferromagnetic would appear. So, is there a reason why we have to jump to this much more challenging theory? Why? So, why, so don't we, why don't we use traditional Fermi wave theory to understand this? Theory? Right. So, so, so I mean, we can we can definitely um, understand the phase diagram that way. But uh, what we want here is to understand the properties of the critical point, and there there we sort of have to have to uh, treat the fluctuations of the field phi on equal footing with those with the fermions. Okay, so, so, uh, so this is not exclusive to the conventional treatment. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's just, a, just a different form of relation. Right. Usually, it's a I understand, but you can find that critical point in helium 3. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. It's, 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 it's just a, a, a different perpetuation that can be more convenient for my purpose. So, in this theory, yeah. you're giving that it's a gladiator both space and time. Why? So, here, here uh, when I write grand, I mean, this is, this is, this is, this is going to be spatial grand, but in principle, you're right, it could be also a time derivative squared. This also allows this in the 
Okay, so for the, uh, a, yes. Yeah, I was whether this kind of a, a, a separation of variables can be unique phenomena or it does not have to be phenomena, but the other are the less phenomena, right? Yes. So you, you introduce two degrees of freedom into each Right, right. So you worry about but the counting? Under counting. Right, yeah. So, so it seems like the, the phenomena, the only phenomena I can think of that's not there is overage or interaction. Is there anything that has to do with plus? Yeah, right. So, so, so that that I, I um, throughout these lectures are actually ignored. I, I assume that um, a, all the interactions are short, right? So this is that that manifests itself by the fact that the field theory that I'm writing is completely local in space. And so it, it's it's an interesting point. So sort of, uh, how do I think about this field phi? Is this a property of the same electrons, or is this some external degree of freedom? And I think the right way to think about it is that it doesn't really matter. It could be either. Okay, so uh, the uh, magnetic moments could be a property of the same iterative electrons, or they, they could come from some other degree of freedom which is localized. Uh, the universal properties are not going to be present. Well, but it's kind of interesting, right? Because if I take this really as a, as a guide to engineering in the static system, I can say that take a, 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 a quantum critical point out of some critical Yes. And figure out how to build that in so <laughs> yeah, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So 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 I can discuss with you for for the for the pneumatic there are systems where we really, uh, the pneumatic degree of freedom is a different orbital, the localized orbital right. 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 So for for the uh, pneumatic you would write a very similar quantum field theory, uh, only that now the the field phi would be a, a, a scalar field plus or minus, and that would represent the pneumatic order factor. Has two configurations, therefore it could be plus or minus. Okay, so you write the same kind of action for the fermions. Uh, this is an this is an action for uh, in a uh, ionizing field, and uh, the, the coupling term between the two is now going to look like this. This is an allowed term by symmetry. So phi is the isomatic field that changes sign under uh, under 90 degree rotation. So the fermion bilinear that it couples to has to have the same symmetry. So it, it, it can be local in space, it has to involve, it involve gradients, and the leading order term will look like this. Okay, so it has to be uh, a, to, to have uh, powers of Q of uh, a, a momentum in it. Okay, and this parameter lambda is this, the, the uh, coupling constant, that's the so-called Yukawa coupling. Okay, so, so uh, a, right, so this is basically the field theory, and now we just have to solve it. Okay, and, and the reason this field theory is difficult is because of the fact that we have a Fermi surface. Okay, so usually when we think about quantum field theory, we, we have relativistic field theory, so all the gap distribution freedom only occur at one point in uh, the momentum space. Okay, and here the trouble is that the uh, gap distance occurs in the whole, uh, on the whole surface, and that, that's basically what, what makes this problem hard. Okay, so a, 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 the early treatments of this problem said that it had all the following logic, well, yeah, the fermions are headache, so let's just uh, integrate them up. Okay, so uh, just generate the bosonic only action and then treat that the way we know how to treat a bosonic quantum field theory. So uh, uh, the treatment that dates back to Hertz uh, in 70, 75, okay, so uh, uh, you basically integrate out the fermions perturbatively in, in the Yukawa coupling lambda and generate an effective field, uh, field theory for phi and then analyze that. Okay, so uh, the leading order is, is simple, so let's focus uh, on the case of the pneumatic quantum critical point. So uh, basically the, uh, the second order in phi term that you generate in the effective action by integrating out the fermions would come from this diagram. Okay, so this is basically uh, the fermion bubble or the, uh, uh, the pneumatic susceptibility of the, of the electrons. Uh, it has uh, uh, this kind of behavior. Okay, there's a constant term here that I didn't write, but the um, the uh, most important frequency and, and momentum uh, uh, dependence that you get out of this term has this form. So f of q is, is basically qx squared minus qy squared. That's this form factor that, that I wrote before. Okay, so um, and uh, a, 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 right. so, so this is uh, right, sorry, this is uh, a basically cosine of theta where in Cosine of two, two, 2 theta, where theta is the um, angle of, of the wave vector q. 
Okay, that's there and because of the of the cold spot, this vanishes at 45 degrees. And there's this uh, a monomega over mod Q term, which is the so-called Landau damping term. Okay, so what what this what this term actually uh, physically what this term means is basically that fluctuations of the field phi get damped because of coupling to the to the particle continuum of the of the Fermi surface. Okay, so uh, this mod omega, if you if you analytically continue that to real frequency, this is an bar frequency, it becomes I omega. So that's a damping term. That's the, the damping term in the equation of motion to the field phi. Okay, so now one other thing to notice here is that we started from a completely local quantum field theory, but now after we've integrated out to the fermions, we get, we get these uh, non-analytic terms in frequency and Q, which will translate into non-local terms in time and space. If we, if we go back to, uh, to uh, time and space, okay, then this is actually the consequence of the fact that we've integrated out a gapless degree of freedom, maybe, maybe the uh, fermions at, at the fermion surface. Okay, so there are, of course, higher order terms that we can generate, basically all of these, uh, <coughs> all of these uh, the cubic terms and square terms and so forth. Okay, so uh, these are the type of uh, effective actions that you get. Okay, so uh, for the pneumatic, you get um, a, this effective action, basically the Q squared plus R plus uh, this term that you get from second order, model made over Q times some constant, okay, plus higher order terms. Okay, so now, a, in principle, there could be also an omega squared term here for the bare action okay, that uh, Arun asked about, but uh, this term is going to be irrelevant with respect to that term, so I didn't write it. Okay, okay, the dynamical critical exponent, which is basically the way time scales with respect to uh, space here, unlike the, uh, a, a, the, the problem in the insulator where that was one, okay, time and space scale the same way, here it's actually three. Okay, you can read it that off from here. This is the way frequency scales uh, with respect to Q. Okay, and these, in the case of a spin density wave that's a little bit different, you can, you can do the same thing, the same, same diagrams, okay, same, same, a, a, a similarly looking diagrams, but this would be the vector field phi, this would be uh, a male, a, a male a vector. Okay, with you, the uh, a answer that you get is of this form. So this, is, this will be the effective action of the field phi. It has a Q squared plus R plus gamma times mod omega without the one over Q. The way we think about that is that a, 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 it's, a, it's a one over mod Q, but now Q a, is finite. Okay, you actually expand around the finite wave vector, which is the wave vector of the, of the nail order parameter. Okay, so this is some constant that you can absorb into this one. And, and again, there's some higher order terms. Okay, so uh, here the dynamical critical exponent is actually different. It's two because of the fact that you don't get the, uh, the Q in the denominator here. Okay, and uh, a, a, the, the uh, reasoning in, in, uh, in, in the early papers was that uh, the, the higher order terms, for instance, if you added a phi to the fourth here, that would be irrelevant with respect to this Gaussian action as long as d plus z, which is like the effective dimension, is bigger or equal to 4. Okay, 4 is here the upper critical dimension, just like in the usual case. But now it's d plus z rather than d plus 1. Okay, so for instance, it's, it's, it, it, for the pneumatic in, in, in two spatial dimensions, d is 2, but z is 3. So a two spatial dimensions is actually already above the upper critical, critical dimension, and it's enough to keep only the Gaussian part of the action. Okay, so the exponents that you expect would be mean field exponents, even in 3D. Okay, now, now uh, this, this argument is actually not correct. Okay, it's very physically appealing, but it's not correct. The reason it's not correct is that uh, uh, the higher order terms that we write here are not necessarily just phi to the fourth, uh, for the same reason that we got that these non analytic terms in the, in the quadratic terms, like, like, like mod omega. We can also get singular momentum and frequency dependencies in the, in the quartic terms. You get phi to the fourth over Q. But that term would be more relevant than what you would naively expect on, on, the, on the basis of, uh, of uh, the, the usual arguments. Okay, though, a, a better, but still naive way to justify this, okay, to basically uh, a, 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 a use this uh, Gaussian action, would be to uh, a, appeal to the large energy. To the, Largely, larger expansion. Okay, so uh, we have to introduce some some small parameter. Okay, this this uh, problem doesn't really have a small parameter. Okay, we can't really think of lambda as small. 
because we're seeing that this, uh, this gamma here is actually proportional to lambda squared, but still that's going to dominate at uh, a small enough fre a frequency and things. Okay, so uh, a, a, what we can do is generalize the problem. So a, a, instead of uh, one or two fermion flavors, for instance, in the pneumatic problem, you have two, two uh, spin flavors, you, you uh, consider n fermion flavors. And now you can uh, try to organize the, uh, the, the diagrammatic expansion in powers of 1 over n. And then uh, work order in order in, uh, in powers of uh, a 1 over n. And then the uh, a diagrammatic series can actually simplify. So uh, it's convenient for this, uh, for this purpose to rescale lambda in this way. Okay, so uh, you write a lambda with a, with, a, uh, a, with a rescaling factor of 1 over square root of n. And then you see that uh, the leading order in the uh, in effective action for phi, uh, which is this term that we wrote before, is actually going to be order 1 to the power of 1 over n. Okay, the reason is that every vertex here has a lambda over square root of n. So there are two of these. But now, uh, in this bubble, you can freely sum over the fermion flavor. Okay, so uh, uh, that, that has, a, has a factor of n in it. Basically, all the fermions couple in the same way to this boson. So, so uh, that gives you a factor of n, so they cancel, and this would hold actually to all main diagrams. Okay, so uh, a, 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 any uh, a addition of extra bubbles would actually uh, not add a, any factor of, of 1 over n. So this is the so-called RPA series. It's, an, it's an, uh, a, a, a geometric series, and you can sum it easily. Okay, and that basically gives you the same result as what you would get from this Gaussian action. Okay, so, uh, Right, so uh, central gave some homework problems, so the homework problem is to work out all this. Uh, um, um, right, I have some better homework problems later on. Um, so uh, now, uh, uh, basically any, any diagram that is, that's not part of the series uh, is going to be down by factors of 1 over n. Okay, so for instance, if you take this diagram, you see that uh, you still have a factor of n from the summation over fermion flavors here. But you get two additional vertices, so that has a factor of 1 over n. And, and you don't have any summation over n to compensate for that. Okay, so that has a factor of 1 over n, this one as well. And also the fermion self energy, maybe a uh, correction to the, to the quadratic fermion action, which has this leading order diagram in it, that's also going to be down by a factor of 1 over n for the same reason. Now, Okay, this actually turns out to have a uh, interesting frequency dependence. Okay, so it, it is down by a factor of one over n, but if you nevertheless consider this term, that actually has an uh, omega to the power of two thirds dependence. Okay, and that's interesting because uh, that's a smaller exponent than one, which is what you get in the bare action. Okay, so uh, the fermions are indeed very strongly scattered here by the pneumatic calculations. They are over that. Okay, everywhere on, on the Fermi surface except for at, at the cold spot, the factor of F K here. Okay, but this is all for the magnet. For the antiferromagnet, everything's a little bit different, but uh, a, the accounting is very similar. This would be here, a omega to the power of half, right at the hot spots of the, the antiferromagnet. Okay, now, a, a, it turns out that this uh, large N approach actually fails. Okay, so assuming for the moment that this is an appropriate theorem for such circuits, is it possible to take that information and then turn it into some information related to the transport coefficients? Right. Turn the things which are measured in this term. Yeah, so so it's possible, it's not it's not so easy. So so uh, it's not straightforward because um okay, right, this is a single particle lifetime. Yeah. So so and then you would want to transport that. Can you use a Boltzmann equation for these programs? Right, so, so um, yeah, so in principle, no. In principle, you can't, right? Because the Boltzmann equation assumes that you have coherent quasi particles, and here you don't. So you'll have to work harder. It's, it's still possible, but uh, right, but right, I think, I think yeah, right now we're struggling with a more basic problem than right. But uh, of course, that's what we ultimately want to do. But I think there's a statement of fact this is what you're proposing is the domination of the Very plus one for how old and right. I mean this is just something that's been done. Yeah. As a way to connect to experiments saying that both this is not saying this is not this is a 
Right. Yeah, no, but, but I mean, sticking so this is a whole free equation. No, 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 so the question is how this relates to the resistivity. Yeah. There's no control, there's no way to produce a right. finite resistivity. Right. No, no, so, so the, yeah, that, that's, that's the important point that to, uh, to turn this into resistivity, you'll have to deduce some mechanism to uh, lose so momentum, right? So, so, uh, so okay, far. Fine, and, but you could turn it into a viscosity and a permutation. Yes, yeah, that, that would be the next question. But, well, there are gangs of thematical critical points now in the world, apparently. It would be nice to be able to do a resistivity experiment and confirm that you're dominated by the magic of quantum critical fluctuations. That would be a lovely the heat capacity. Okay, so the just because that's uh, uh, sort of conceptually simpler than, than, than uh, yeah. I mean, uh, right. So, so it's a little bit unfortunate that you guys measure resistivity. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can measure. No, no, yeah. that's a misrepresentation. We can measure whatever. You want. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, right. So uh, somehow, right. I mean, for, for, for us, um, okay, imaginary time is more real than real time. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, right. So, so, so now, now um, let me just um, explain why why this kind of simple reasoning of the one over n expansion actually doesn't work. This is a seminal work by uh, some uh, from 2009. So it turns out that the the, uh, the, the real power of diagram the one one over n isn't this you know, what's given by this uh, a naive uh, argument. Okay, and the reason is that uh, some of the uh, Apparently, subleading diagrams in one over n actually diverge. Okay, and to correct this uh, divergence, you have to take into account the self energy. Okay, so that cuts off the divergence, but that has a one over n in it. Okay, so this one over n goes upstairs and, uh, and raises the real power of the, of the diagram. Okay, so uh, uh, what Sunset showed is that uh, there's actually infinitely many diagrams that are all at the same order in one over n. Okay, they're all in the order n to the zero. And this is, these are all the, the so-called planar diagrams. These are the, the, all the diagrams that you can draw on a, on a, on a plane without crossing any lines. Okay, so a diagram like this with a vacuum with a ground state energy would be power n to the zero. Okay, and there are infinitely many of these, not just the RPA diagrams. This diagram would be a crossing here. This would be n to the minus. Okay, so even at large n, this problem is still very, very complicated. It's not given by the Gaussian action, and uh, it might then we really have to do something else. Yes. So, uh, getting back to the experiment with the mass of the universe, right. which is very nice. Uh, yeah. Does that mean maybe I can sum all these things to a simple? Maybe, yeah. You know, right. The mean field statement that you made earlier. Yeah. Kind yeah, of there, and, 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 unfortunately, there are several different ways to get that, and we can discuss that later, but, but actually that's very suggestive. Is it one possibility that it's a classical edge transition? Well, I mean, it, it is 1 over t going to 0, so that seems to be a quantum sort of, uh, right, I mean, um, in, so a, you told us that there's no theory for the resistivity going to 0. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 but, 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 but uh, I think um, a, Michael was a, referring to the magic so susceptibility, the theory of so I understand. So, yeah. the classical theory would produce that result. A, a classical theory. Um, yeah, right. 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 Yeah. Right. So, right. High so, temperature transition and just set PC would do it. There's no such thing as zero temperature. So, let's focus on empirical reality. You dial some variable of the material. You pass through a phase transition. You'd like to know is that a quantum phase transition or is it a classical phase transition? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So if I had given you a homework problem with that divergence of the susceptibility and I didn't tell you what the story was, you could just as well have deduced that it was a classical phase transition. Well, the p star goes to zero at some point. Pardon? Yeah. So it looks like one over t minus p star, but p star vanishes at some token, which means it would yeah. look like a pure theory. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact that it's um, sort of scaling towards zero, that for, for me, that means it's okay. But it's, it's one. Yeah. 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 In your calculations, you, you can't exclude that you find nonlinear behavior in the low temperature regime that you don't resolve, right? So very close to the position. Yeah. You do not exclude that. No, no, no. no. It's, so, so, absolutely. So, so, this is uh, right. So, 
So this is true when we're above the but, but of course, you can never exclude me. You, you can't reach zero temperature here. So definitely, you can't, you can't exclude this. There's another crossover. Um, right, so, so uh, um, yeah, so the, the main message here is that this, this problem is, is really tough. Okay, and that's my second, uh, my second homework assignment. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, so uh, uh, right, so, just, so uh, what we really need here is, uh, uh, as theorists, what we really need here is uh, another type of control, uh, uh, control parameter, which is not just one over n, uh, to uh, solve the problem in some limit and then try to extrapolate. And there are kind of several of these, uh, of, of, uh, uh, several uh, uh, field theory approaches that have been taken. One of them is just this two brute force of some uh, by order of loops. Um, uh, okay, so we can't, uh, in, in large end, we can't sum with only the uh, naive one, uh, uh, one, one for n to the zero diagrams. And uh, that's been done by Lipnitsky and uh, Sachdev up to three loops. And they found that the uh, naive scaling that you get from Hertz theory is actually preserved. But then Holder and Metzner went to four loops and found that this breaks right down. Okay, um, uh, okay so uh, um, uh, Sintel and collaborators uh, proposed a double expansion. So you basically expand a, a, a growth in one over n and in, the, in a, a parameter called epsilon, which is basically the uh, a power of Q that appears in the bare bosonic propagator. So instead of Q squared, you write Q to the one plus epsilon. Okay, and you uh, expand in small epsilon. Okay, so so uh, uh, this means that in the bare action, the bare action now is is actually non-local in space. There are long-range interactions, but it turns out that uh, close to epsilon equals zero, you can actually control this uh, problem that some sick they found. Okay, the uh, the uh, uh, offending diagrams are basically all down by factors of epsilon. Okay, so so uh, this is the correct way to justify a uh, Hertz theory, originally, and not not just any large n. Uh, there are other approaches that were proposed. So some uh, proposed a co co dimension expansion. Basically, you keep the Fermi surface uh, in a one dimensional, but you expand the spatial dimension uh, around two point five. Okay, uh, uh, Sri Raghu and company proposed the matrix large end, so instead of uh, taking uh, uh, just the number of fermion flavors to infinity, you also take the number of bosons and squared to infinity, okay, which bosons live in a, a form a mat matrix structure. Okay, so there are many, many different approaches here. The results are somewhat sensitive on the approach that you take. In, 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 okay, but to a large degree, the problem is open. Now, uh, let me just mention that these problems are special to two, spa to two spatial dimensions. Okay, in, in, in three spatial dimensions, they seem not to occur. So there, the first theory is probably correct. But uh, 2D is probably a relevant case for many of the materials. Okay, so many of the materials are at least quasi 2D. Uh, right, so uh, uh, the next thing uh, I'll talk about uh, next time is uh, superconducting uh, instabilities near a pneumatic quantum critical point. And I'll argue that they're probably strong, so probably the uh, a, a pneumatic quantum critical point, the bare pneumatic quantum critical point in the metal doesn't really exist. And, uh, a, and I'll talk about some uh, numerical experiments in the new of this problem. Okay. So, uh, Why do you expand around dimension 2.5? Right, so uh, <laughs> it turns out that uh, there the uh, coupling constant lambda, this uh, Yukawa coupling, is actually marginal. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of the same logic as we do in, uh, a, in the Wilson Fisher point. So we are really interested in the ideal model in three dimensions. But you know that the upper critical dimension is, is, uh, is actually four. So it, it, 